creation of the industry to support World War II. The industry that developed really did take a toll on the aquatic environment when industrial and uh, municipal effluent went into the river, as well as the combustion of fuels to support the industrial pro processes in Sarnia, uh, contributed also to the degradation of, aquatic, of the aquatic environment. One of the byproducts of uh, incomplete combustion is uh, a class of chemicals called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs for short. PAHs are a toxic bioaccumulative bio substance that was linked to the development of cancerous liver tumors in fish found, found around the Great Lakes in uh, the 70s and 1980s. PAHs also occur naturally in coal and crude oil and gasoline. Um, and so these are all uh, pro industries that were on the landscape in the Sarnia area. So it's, it was prudent to do some additional studies in the Sarnia area of bottom dwelling fish to see if they were being uh, negatively impacted by uh, these particular compounds. Sarnia isn't really the only area that had PAHs prevalent in the aquatic environment, just because, you know, um, in the 40s, the Industrial Revolution, there was a heavy reliance on uh, uh, fossil fuels uh, around the Great Lakes. So it was a very pervasive compound around the Great Lakes. And again, there was a lot of studies that linked PAHs to the development of cancerous liver tumors in, in fish. The next slide. So because of the studies in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, um, there was uh, a lot of work done that recognized bottom dwelling fish uh, are really good indicators of uh, contaminated sediment. And PAH is, is a contaminant that does bind to uh, sediment. And so as sediment dwelling and feeding fish, they become really good indicators of uh, sediment quality and um, of the local aquatic habitat. Because the liver is a filtering organ, it's sensitive to contaminants. Um, so the effects of exposure of contaminants becomes uh, more visible in this organ, which is, which is why uh, the study looks at liver, um, the liver tissue. So again, by comparing the rates of liver tumors uh, in the river to other areas around the Great Lakes, we can get a sense of what the aquatic environment quality is in the Sarnia, in the St. Clair River area. It's also important to note that through the studies, um, we also learned that it's better to study older fish. So the longer the exposure, the more likely they will manifest um, uh, impacts of being exposed to contaminated sediment. So the next slide. So brown bullhead uh, was predominantly used for a lot of studies between Canada and the US. Some sucker fish species were also used and they, these uh, species tend to be site faithful. They don't migrate very far and they tend to reside generally in a relatively small geographical area. So they, may, so they, they do make very good indicators of, um, of environmental quality. And lastly, there was a, a, a lot of studies done across the Great Lakes. So the development of a very large database uh, resulted. And the database on the Canadian side was particularly important because it allows us then to compare um, uh, tumor rates across different geographic locations. So the studies uh, that we conducted in the St. Clair River, uh, there were a few. And if you are on slide six, here are the studies that we conducted. So on the Canadian side, particularly in the St. Clair River, uh, Sarnia area, there's a significant complex of refineries, uh, as well as a history of coal-fired power plants. Um, and so it was, it was really prudent to, uh, be, because of the landscape, to conduct additional studies. So there were several. Uh, that were conducted as early as uh, 1990, where um, some caged fish were uh, caged downstream from the industrial complex for two years. 
the, the records are old, so I, I don't know the number of fish, but there was one fish that developed uh, some changes in the tissue of its liver, suggesting that it might've developed into a, a cancerous tumor. So based on that one finding, um, there was a effort to conduct more studies to really determine if cancerous uh, rates were higher in uh, bottom dwelling fish than elsewhere across the Great Lakes. So in 2002, 67 livers were uh, analyzed from 17 different species. There was no cancerous tumors found. However, not all of these species were bottom dwelling and um, many were too young, meaning they were younger than three years old. So they might not have had sufficient exposure to develop these cancerous tumors. So in 2000, between 2002 and 2006, Environment Canada uh, embarked to conduct a huge study across the lower Great Lakes. And they conducted a particular study in the St. Clair River. Unfortunately, they didn't use the brown bullhead, they used the, the short head red horse sucker, which is another alternative fish species. And this species was used because it's, it's abundant in the river and it's abundant throughout the river. So of these uh, livers that were uh, collected, I believe there was uh, over 120, not one liver tumor was found. And then when we went to present these findings, it was members of the Walpole Island community that indicated to us that brown bullheads were available within the Walpole Island Delta and uh, preferred that a study be conducted using brown bullheads to allow a comparison to be conducted between uh, uh, the St. Clair River using brown bullhead and other areas around the Great Lakes. This was um, kind of the, the kickstart to a collaboration that resulted in 2013-14 uh, when Environment Canada collaborated with Walpole Island to collect brown bullheads from the Walpole Island Delta. This was, um, this was a, uh, I think, a, a point of pride for certainly for um, uh, myself and and hopefully the Heritage Center because we collectively uh, worked with the community to share kind of the, the the study that we wanted to do and um, and got feedback from the community on the study design and we did hear from the community they wanted this study done because of the concern that contaminants that were uh, being um, discharged upstream were settling in the Delta. So this was really a win-win. We were gonna conduct another study that would allow a greater comparison. And we were gonna satisfy uh, concerns within the community about upstream contaminant settling in the Delta. So the next slide. So brown bullheads were studied across the lower Great Lakes. And the result of this work identified an average tumor rate that occurred in these bottom dwelling fish. Similar to people, there's just an average rate where uh, liver cancer uh, or cancerous tumors develop in the livers. And that average rate was about 2%. And that was based on a collection of um, roughly 1,300 uh, fish from various um, areas around the Great Lakes. Um, almost half of which was from urban sites. So the combined uh, collection of these fish just uh, generated a roughly 2% kind of background or average uh, liver tumor rate. This was significant because this is really the benchmark now that we can compare uh, the liver tumor rates in the St. Clair River to. And the next slide. So the two key studies that were done in the St. Clair River, just to recap, were um, the first one on the short head red horse suckers where no uh, liver tumors were found. And this was again conducted in the early 2000s. Um, 126 livers were collected from the river and 100 were collected from Lake Huron. No liver tumors were found from the fish collected in the St. Clair River, while one liver tumor was detected in a fish collected from Lake Huron. 2013-14, uh, as I said, we worked with the community to um, collect brown bullhead and we did, we were successful in collecting uh, 60 over that two year period. And the ages were um, five years and older, which was great. So the older the fish, 
uh, kind of the better. The more likely it has had long exposure to contaminated sediment if it existed. Next slide. So these are just, uh, so uh, sometimes, you know, so we collected, I'm just looking at our uh, red horse sucker. So we collected um, 126 from the river, 100 from Lake Huron, zero found in the river, uh, and one found in Lake Huron. So that was our first study. And we thought, again, that that was pretty good news until um, we learned that really, it wasn't as scientifically robust as it could have been had we used the, the brown bullhead, which we really didn't know existed because the majority of the habitat is, of course, in Walpole Island. And it's not a fish that's really found throughout the river just because of the lack of wetlands. Um, but nonetheless, the news from that um, study were, were, of course, positive. But we were thrilled, and this is the next slide, to collaborate with Walpole Island to collect uh, our goal was to collect 100 fish, uh, three years um, and older, from the Walpole Delta to satisfy the community about concerns of uh, contaminants settling in the Delta. So we embarked on this study. It took us two years to uh, capture the um, 60 fish, and zero liver tumors were uh, detected. Environment Canada did not um, do the analysis of the liver tumors. We sent those away to um, British Columbia, where the Ministry of Agriculture um, assessed those liver tumors. They are the leading agency in liver tumors because of their work in the tar mm -hmm. So if you're studying, if you're following along in the presentation, this is the slide where we have the picture of the uh, Walpole Island fishing crew. The next slide. The next slide is really just um, a snapshot of we set up um, a processing setup right out at the um, I'm not sure what it's called, but I think it's out in the Delta. It's a, like a rod and gun hunt club. And we um, set up there for a couple of days to process the fish. So the collaboration was the Walpole Island uh, provided the, the fishermen and they basically set up nets and, and traps to um, capture the fish. And then they were transported back to this processing station and uh, they were processed. And that just really inclu included some basic measurements like weight, um, weight, and then we dissected the liver, removed the liver, and uh, and put it in fixative for analysis. So the next slide. So this is just a close up of how we um, remove the liver and make several slices so we can get a good uh, cross section of um, the cells that are within the liver, and um, again zero liver tumors were found. And there is a quote from the uh, pathologist who conducted the um, analysis. And he says basically in a very scientific way that uh, there was no um, evidence of even um, precancerous cells in, in the livers that he evaluate, evaluated. Right around the same time, so generally for a scientific study, we tend to want to get 100 fish. That way we can do a percentage. So if we had had the, the 100 fish, we could have seen that percentage that uh, and compared it to the 2% background rate. But right around the same time, uh, the University of uh, Windsor was conducting a, a sediment survey to um, assess the contaminant levels in the, in the Walpole Island Delta. And the contaminants associated with inducing liver tumors in fish was, uh, was extremely low. And so in consultation with the Heritage Center, we opted to preserve the, um, the brown bullhead population within the Delta and, uh, and not try and collect the additional 40 fish. Um, but we, we do just based on the 60 fish that were collected, it would be unlikely that we would have, um, you know, the remaining 40 with, with a high percentage with a high uh, liver tumor rate. And so our, the last slide, and I'm sorry if I'm moving fast. Um, so when we, this is one of the uh, 14 criteria that we assess 
uh, kind of areas of concern around the Great Lakes. These are highly degraded areas around the Great Lakes, and we evaluate the prevalence of liver tumors in, in bottom-dwelling fish. And so we, we basically asked two questions. Um, was the incidence of liver tumors in the AOC, so within the St. Clair River AOC, did it exceed uh, the rate at um, an unimpacted site? So like Huron, for example, is a really good reference site for us. It's upstream of the industrial complex. And no, our rate was actually lower. Uh, we had zero with liver tumors and Lake Huron had one. And then um, did we find any uh, kind of cancer tumors at all in any of the studies that were conducted? And the answer was, was no. So based on uh, the studies that were conducted, the uh, Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implementation Committee of which Walpole Island is a member is recommending that this criteria be designated as not impaired. And so today, I, the last slide is my um, bequetch. And so tonight, I just wanted to share those results. As I said, the report and the uh, um, engagement with Walpole Island uh, over, I, I think it's spanned about four years now, has been nicely summarized by Naomi Williams at the Heritage Center. And um, the intent of the presentation was to uh, really, I guess, comp uh, solicit the chief and council's um, uh, comments or questions and um, to complete, I guess, our, our engagement, our consultation process on this uh, specific um, criteria. So I, question? Also, one question. Okay. Why didn't you use uh, pickerel? Is pickerel a uh, bottom dwelling or carp? Yes. Yeah, so, um, if I understand, so this is looking at liver tumors in bottom dwelling fish because of the exposure to contaminated sediment. So with pickerel and walleye and those uh, those types of fish, they're highly migratory, and so it doesn't. They could pick up the contaminants. Um, in other locations other than those geographical sites uh, where they reside. Um, it's not to say that we don't look at contaminant levels in those fish, uh, that we do. We look at though the contaminant levels um, under another criteria, which is relevant to the consumption of fish uh, and wildlife. No. Okay. So we did, um, you know, hear from community members regarding, you know, the prevalence or the observations of tumors on pickerel. Um, we held a workshop where, where this was brought up and we explained then um, the reason why brown bullhead are chosen is because they're in contact with the sediments where the, uh, the pollution is uh, settling. So to get a better indicator of um, local contamination, we looked at brown bullheads Whereas if you're using walleye, they could be picking up the contamination from, you know, some other river or some other place. And that doesn't give us a good indication of, you know, where they picked it up from and what those levels would be like and how they affect our fish here at home. Uh, brown bullhead also um, um, stay within a small home range so they don't migrate mi uh, migrate very far so they're good at um and in, as an indicator species and in showing you what the pollution looks like in a spot that they were caught any other questions not are you looking for any type of uh, acknowledgement or a follow-up recommendation from council as a result of the presentation? Um, yes, I think there was a motion by the Heritage Center regarding uh, the this, this status recommendation. And um, I believe it is a recommendation that they're making to the council to either support or, or not. Yeah. 
Yeah, the recommendation from us was that the Achievement Council accept the uh, status recommendation for the beneficial use impairment for um, fish tumors. Um, that recommendation being that it be changed from requiring further assessment because we did all the uh, research here on the First Nation that was requested to uh, not impaired based on the uh, findings from those from that research. I guess this is one question. I guess uh, I think I'm getting along with the chiefs trying to say. That. I guess think about is uh, dietary intake. Our community members love fish. I know we take a uh, walleye or uh, perch or bass, and I guess they're not uh, bottom feeders, but we also uh, harvested uh, and ate sturgeon and catfish, and even bullhead. They're not bullhead. Uh, Dogfish, and you, I think you did mention carp too, right? So I, I guess those those are things that I guess would uh, bring in my mind. Uh, since we consume those and harvest those at specific times of the year, uh, how would those affect our forefathers uh, or ancestors since this has been going on? I guess um, that would be a, a point taken. I mean, I guess it's kind of late now, but I think that's what we're getting at is uh, the effects of the doctor. Those fish that we eat, and we also take water intake as well. Other things, water. So I was just wondering what the compound of effects would be. That's all. Okay. Um, regarding the uh, our consumption of fish, there is a, a separate beneficial use impairment directly related to fish consumption, where these things would be looked at. Am I correct, April? Uh, yes, yes, that's that's correct. Yeah, and I, I think we hear that a lot. Um, you know, how is the indicator species selected? And and uh, people tend to uh, want to see species that are uh, that are more readily consumed or commonly consumed. But you know, these brown bullheads and and other sucker fish, so the shorthead red horse sucker and other white suckers are up north. Um, they just have a history of being used. Um, in, in earlier studies, which really builds a database to allow comparison. And so um, uh, just for, can, you know, to allow comparison and for consistency, um, continuing to use the brown bullhead, some of the other suckers is, is kind of, uh, it's recommended. But I, we do get that a lot, why, why this species and, and it is, a, as Naomi explained, a really good indicator of local contamination because they do res they are site faithful. They don't travel far. Um, they are they dwell and they feed from they feed from the insects that reside in that muck. So they have very very high exposure versus another fish that might be more um, predatory or migratory. Um, and as Naomi said, I know it's it's really confusing about you know this uh, how we look at each of these fourteen different criteria kind of separately, but we do have one specifically where we do look at the consumption and the contaminant levels in uh, fish that are are commonly consumed. Consumed. And just for information's sake, the uh, fish consumption beneficial use impairment is still listed as being impaired. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, if I can just, you know, I know, I know time is tight, but these, these geographically really degraded sites around the Great Lakes, most are in the U.S., so several are in Canada. A lot of the degradation resulted from contaminated sediment from industrial and urban pollution. And so um, this is, this is one way to try to measure the impacts of contamination on on fish and uh, again these bottom dwelling fish uh, have been studied extensively in Canada and the US there is a huge database and uh, they they really are felt to be a really good indicator of um, of, of local conditions 
And then again, the sediment study that was conducted by uh, the University of Windsor, um, it, we didn't proceed to, to catch additional fish because the contaminant levels were, were very low in the Delta, particularly PAHs were well below um, any guidelines associated with the creation of liver tumors. Well, the long and short of this is okay to eat the uh, sucker and the bullhead. Uh, that's uh, noise anything else? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. My, uh, I have some background noise. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I think it was just making a comment. So the long and short of it of it is, don't eat the brown bullhead. <laughs> I think that is what he was saying. <laughs> yeah, and interestingly enough, there is there is guidance on brown bullhead. Like it is one of the species that we collect for um, sport fish consumption. Um, and so we did, as part of the study, provide um, the Ministry of the Environment with with fillets to. Um, so that they could examine the, the contaminant levels in the, in the fillets of, of those fish. So we have current data now uh, that they can use to provide some guidance on consumption of those fish species in particular. For their uh, fish consumption guidelines, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I make a motion to accept their presentation. I also make a uh, one to follow up uh, to accept their recommendation for approval. Second place. Second by uh, Burton. Are there any uh, objections? Abstention? I hear none. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Miigwech. Bamapi. Bamapi. <coughs>
open mic. So we connected with Mark Shaw. So we connected with him. Have you connected with him? I have talked to um, the navigator, and I have some additional information. I have talked to the um, request for reimbursement of the cost that I already paid for the unit um, since when it was opened, and it didn't cost back to 2016 that can be identified and can be added for reimbursement and it's already paid for by it. Listen, who's the uh, coordinator, the current coach coordinator of that the unit? Is it Darren and I think? Maybe. Uh, is, there, is there anybody operating that uh, at all? Uh, we do have a uh, staff member operating there, a medical staff member, and Dan is an output and the other two medical staff at all. Okay, then my question is who can we get an update on? Because we're looking at a new fiscal cycle and uh, 
Um, there's a lot of people out there that are hurting that we have to uh, uh, assist. So hopefully there's a plan that will come at the next regular council meeting and uh, we'll be ready for our approval for the budget, etc. Anything else, Marcia? Um, um, one of the attorney managers that ASIP is dealing with the, the family problems that we have and following up and uh, taking new applications. Um, I had some information that we got there and there was a need. Um, I've seen somebody there. Yep, I agree. I'm being asked when I want to tell you, do and anybody there yet? I got all these fans and asked me, you know. And I'm hearing similar stories that uh, other First Nations and their community members, their um, members are getting all kinds of assistance. And, and where are we? They're, they're, that money is there. It's uh, available to us. And uh, we should be securing it, if not more, than uh, uh, help our uh, community and our family members. I agree. We've got to get this thing, as I mentioned, done. So I will leave that up to uh, Marsha. We could uh, meet with James and uh, see what we can do to uh, get this program going again. What was the other item there that Jerry had mentioned? <clears throat> to approve that.
seven point seven is actually still the exception, I guess. Yes. Well, I will assume by using. January 12th minutes with the noted uh, correction of 50,000 now to 500,000. Moved move by Marsha, second or switch? Second by Lee. All those in favor of the January 12th minutes? I declare the uh, minutes carried. Now, business arising out of those minutes, the contract in question. For the consultant to continue on with our planning session that we have coming up in the first part of uh, March, very soon, next week, I believe. Do we have a mover and second for that contract? Okay. Yep. Is that attached here? No? That would have been the previous one. James? So we did approve for the contract for this planning session coming up, but there was a proposal that there would be assistance for planning session for the coming meeting. Yeah. And so that what has, that's what has been approved. Okay. So we do have approval for this for meeting next week. So um, we approaching on a uh, on a venue basis, I guess. Uh, is the uh, bill coming through with days or? Uh... Well, we have council approval for the planning session next week. Yep. But uh, this meeting, we have put a proposal forward for many planning sessions to take place over the next week. Right. Yeah. And so, if you wanted to revisit that proposal, you can make a motion now or we could bring it to tomorrow. I think we're going to have to bring it back, okay? Because, uh, as I recall, there's been a change in the amount as well. That will be tabled and that will be uh, brought up as uh, new business item, new item. Okay, so, so good for good for financial. Yep, financial. Yeah, we'll do that planning uh, session itself as well as the, the contract. Okay, we can proceed on with the next minutes. January 26th. Any questions on those minutes? Question. Yep. The greenhouse. Yep. Time to take it.
James, have you got any uh, status on this uh, greenhouse project? I know they've been meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't. Are there any counselors? We don't have one task force meeting, but uh, um, the task force, as I understand, was satisfied with the uh, uh, with the way the board is a nonprofit. Uh, but I understand that the subsequent meeting, I couldn't hear everything that was on, but. I was the Zoom, Zoom connection with it. I couldn't uh, couldn't appear to the second. So uh, um, my understanding was that uh, council recommended that the army provide the specifics as to uh, verifying the five acres and also the, any any support for shortfall. Uh, so uh, according to Lyle, that was uh, given, but I don't I don't have the problem with the army providing that uh, detail. Uh, my suggestion. our council to go for a profit greenhouse complex, why not do both? Uh, and I would recommend that the army take the lead on that. They'd have to do the feasibility assignment, uh, uh, all, all of that, uh, the work plan and so on, would probably end up being a subsidiary corporation. That I don't see why we can't do both. That's a not-for-profit and also a profit enterprise as well. In the meantime, we have this this one greenhouse that we've got the time and we've been doing for a period of time. And that's that, that, that becomes a template, I guess, for the future greenhouse that are, that are developed. Anyway, that's my thinking. I can prove this. Uh, I do want to wait for the Diamond's confirmation of the uh, availability of the land and, and, and support for shortfall. We still have from March 31st, according to this week. Uh, but my recommendation is to go forward with it as a not for profit. And then do the uh, feasibility and so on for the profit greenhouse complex. Well, I believe our discussion was along that line. I don't think we had a problem with whether it's profit or not for profit. What we had, and Bert has pointed that out, is a feasibility study, which you want to look at. Either or, wherever it's going to be profit or not for profit, because where are the funds going to come year after year? Other things, so we get a, you might get a commitment from the army now to put the additional charge, but you have other costs that at the end of the day. So those are those are concerns in the business plan to keep it going so that it will be reasonable. Even if they dial in at zero every year, they're still going to have something to throw up the other. And, and that's what this meeting is stating to us that we may have that because you know you don't want to see it fail. And that's what the chief and some other people stated. And we asked how if we can uh, do market. I think the overall question is, are we going into this with our eyes wide open to the concerns of, uh, uh, again, if it's a profit or non-profit, uh, how is it going to sustain itself in year three after all the grants run out? Is Tagani making a full-blown commitment that they're going to pick up the operating costs in year three or four to uh, support that enterprise? Well, we, haven't, we haven't seen that from their board. Yeah, so according to the briefing we had from the Clint, uh, the tax force meeting was that uh, the non for profit is going to tag its own development that they're on when it's important. Uh, but that doesn't kick in unless the thing is actually in motion and built. So they're, uh, when Clint set up the land trust years ago, uh, which had $60,000 right now, there was no feasibility set down for that. It was just set up. And then uh, uh, the donors contributed to that. That's that's just a bank account. So that's yeah, not, that's yeah. not an enterprise. We're talking about an enterprise here that's functioning with uh, uh, supplies and uh, other expenses that uh, have to be addressed on an ongoing basis. Yeah. So that was where the donor money came in. Uh, he, <laughs> without proof of it, like uh, I don't think he allowed any proof of that to just do it uh, because he needs five to six million dollars in trust to make this thing happen because of what the analog is. So if we're not getting uh, verification that those donors are that solid, it's, it's not going to fly in the not for profit because he doesn't really want. I don't think Harry Center wants uh, own source revenue or uh, ongoing design money for the maintenance. So the, the game plan is just to secure donor money once the answer is in. So that's 
past, that can't be confirmed at this point, but the uh, Heritage Center uh, feels they have those uh, those commitments that this goes forward to not stop. And I understand that. Still, we need the um, business model to uh, outline what those expenses will be for the five year plan. Yeah, and I think, uh, not only that, but you have to be honest in my own world, I'm using my own words, but I'll be honest. I was just honest with them and saying, well, we're helping with that five year plan because it makes for the doctors from the year where it is. And this is what we're willing to dial in. That's all I'm saying. We're not, we're not going totally against the grain. I think we're, we're looking for some of these things. Uh, you know, it's given. I mean, if we can start it up and we can split it up, it might be swap. And then you've got to have to sit idle. Or just find out how we could help, and that's why we did have the assignment to ask for us and see if we can get the recommendations. And I guess what we can go to Joe is just going to be the council uh, to provide that, whether it's some sort of economic development plan or something like that. I don't know. It's just, yeah, and I think that you know, Larry and Lisa are looking for some kind of more minutes of motion from those supporting this uh, specific project. And uh, although we had a purpose by perhaps two board members, we haven't seen any uh, board minutes to support that. Because it also entails the use of that property there. And uh, uh, number one, I guess, would, would be uh, uh, being utilized. Uh, I would hope uh, as on the lease, I guess, from the First Nation for that property. If um, Tigani isn't going to use it for its purposes, then we have to look at some type of uh, lease agreement for that property for this um, one pocket. It would clearly indicate that it's not in the planning. For, for, uh, plus, we got the side subject of uh, all the necessary infrastructure and so how that was going to be addressed. Is Tigani going to address that? Endless process is going to uh, cover those expenses. And what are those expenses? I can have the task force meeting in and a couple of collaborators with Tijuana. You're going to need a you're going to need a board minute from Tijuana. Yeah. Just just specifically me. Oh yeah, I just have a Serious about it, but we just want to go into the project uh, with our eyes wide open. Oh, yeah. If it's only $41,000 and it's a really, really good project, and then we see if we can do it uh, on a non profit basis plus on a profit basis, then we can find $41,000 elsewhere to initiate this. I don't think we have to uh, grind the world to a halt here. Just Possibility of losing or lapsing on that forty-one thousand dollars that shouldn't push us to uh, making a push or a quick decision. On, honestly, it should be left alone. Yeah, I don't think we're hanging on the forty-one thousand on this product. Well, good then. We'll get the uh, we'll get the uh, board motion from yeah, the board motion is from Tadani, and we'll yeah. proceed on that too. Yeah, and also we want the uh, business plan and feasibility study locked in. I saw to the greenhouse material and the work was 120000 and we couldn't get to have the money to pay for that. So the motion is not reflective of the total cost. Um, it's only the balance of the dollars they have left. And this will take a long time. And then when we got into the to cover the infrastructure costs, the bringing in the gas line, the three phase power, and the cement floors, and the HVAC. I think we covered everything in the interest. Uh, covered everything. 
it's an important place. It's where the buildings are going to be if you have no operation. Force will uh, meet with the farm manager and the uh, uh, zoning board of directors, and uh, this is a very uh, uh, motion I guess to uh, ensure that uh, the uh, land is not acquired by them and uh, they will require any planned uh, transfer of land. There is no planned uh, lease.
went on. Can anyone hear me? Hello? 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 Hi, Chief. Yeah. On February 9th, 7.2, I my vote should have been abstention. And it says I I wasn't, my vote wasn't marked or something. Note it down. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 